Welcome to part three of the multi-part series discussing the feature functionality of Microchip's new MCP3X6X family of Delta Sigma A to D converters. Some of the key features you'll find on the MCP3X6X family of devices are as follows. An SPI interface which supports the standard SPI00 and 11 modes with static and incremental read-write commands with support for single byte fast commands to serve as a quick way to perform operations such as a device reset or conversion start, as well as entering power saving states such as standby, shutdown, or full shutdown modes. A 16-bit SPI communication CRC for securing read command communication sequences and maintaining data integrity against EMI or large transient spikes. Digital offset and gain air calibration features, which can be utilized to compensate for the temperature drift of the offset and gain air of the device. And lastly, the IRQ MDAT digital output pin, which can serve as one of two functions, as an open drain interrupt alert for the various interrupt events, such as the data ready interrupt, or as the raw data output of the Delta Sigma modulator for off-chip filtering and decimation of a digital output code. The first topic of discussion is the SPI interface. The SPI interface supports the standard SPI bus 00 and 11 modes with static and incremental read write operations, as well as single byte fast commands, which require no overhead data and can be used for performing conversions or managing the power consumption of the device. Whether configured for SPI mode 00 or 11, the device will sample the SDI input on the rising edge of the bus clock and transmit on the SDO output on the falling edge of the bus clock. The only difference between the two modes is the default state of the bus clock, with mode 00 indicating a default low state and mode 11 indicating a default high state. The command byte, which determines what operation is to be performed, is comprised of three identifiers. The device address bits, identifying which device on the bus is being targeted, the register address bits identifying which register in the register map the operation is to be performed, and the command type bits identifying whether the operation is to be a read, write, or fast command operation. Lastly, it should be noted that for every command byte transmitted over SDI, a device status byte will be simultaneously transmitted on SDO. The status byte offers a convenient means of detecting and managing the current status of various interrupt sources, such as data ready alerts, configuration register CRC errors, and POR events without the need for the IRQ pin, as each respective interrupt bit can be pulled and cleared with each status byte transmission. The status byte will also contain information regarding whether the device address bits contained within the current command byte match the device address bits hard-coded to the device. Currently, all MCP3X6X devices have a default device address of 01. As previously indicated, the MCP3X6X device offers the ability to individually or sequentially configure one or all registers in the register map by way of a single incremental write command. The first write sequence we'll discuss is the sequential incremental write command. By issuing a command with a command by 10 bits set to 10, the incremental write command will be executed offering the ability to sequentially configure multiple registers within a register set in a single communication sequence. The incremental write command will begin the write sequence by writing to the register address defined by the command byte 52 bits with the ability to write all configuration registers up to the lock register located at address D as illustrated here. Once all register configurations have been completed, the lock register can be written with any value other than A5 to lock the register set and ensure the integrity of the current configuration. If at any time changes to the device configuration are needed, the lock register must be written with an unlock value of A5 before any changes can be made. While the device does not have a dedicated write command for single register operations, a single register write, also referred to as a static write, can be accomplished by sending the command for an incremental write operation and then raising chip select immediately following the first data value transmitted, as demonstrated here. Once the last bit to be written to a register has been received, the write operation will be immediately executed. Therefore, it should be noted that raising chip select before the last bit of a register write has been received will terminate the write sequence, resulting in no update to the current register's contents. Lastly, it should be understood that any attempt to write to a read-only register, such as the ADC data or CRC config registers, 
will be considered an invalid operation and the register pointer will not be incremented. In such a case, the user must terminate the current bus sequence by raising chip select and starting a new communication sequence with a command byte targeting a valid writable address. The MCP3X6X device also offers the ability to individually or sequentially read one or all registers in the register map using a set of read commands. The first read command we'll discuss is the incremental read command. By issuing a command with a command byte 1 0 bits set to 1 1, the incremental read command will be executed, offering the ability to sequentially read multiple registers within the register set in a single communication sequence. As is the case with the incremental write command, the incremental read command will automatically increment the register pointer after each register read, so long as the chip select pin remains asserted low. In the event the chip select pin is raised during a communication sequence, the operation will be aborted immediately. Similar to the incremental write command, the incremental read command will begin the read sequence by reading the register address defined by the command 52 bits and end with the last readable register in the register map, in this case the CRC reg register located at address F, as demonstrated here by using a starting address of 0. An alternative to the incremental read command is the static read command. A static read command can be executed by issuing a command byte with the command 10 bits set to 01, and the command 52 bits indicating the address of the register to be read. Unlike the incremental read command, however, the register pointer is not automatically incremented after each static read. This is not, however, without its benefit. So long as the chip select pin remains asserted low, continued clocking of the SPI bus offers the ability to continuously stream any of the readable registers within the register map. The static behavior of the address pointer in this case can be particularly useful for applications which require continuous data streaming of ADC conversion results via the ADC data register as demonstrated here. In addition to the standard read-write commands, the SPI interface also offers a series of single byte fast commands, which offer a quick and easy way to perform operations such as a device reset or conversion start as well as entering power saving states such as standby, shutdown, or full shutdown modes. There are five fast commands which become available when the fast command enable bit of the IRQ register is set. When in standby mode, execution of the conversion start restart fast command will result in the immediate transition to conversion mode and begin converting. When in ADC shutdown mode, however, execution of this fast command will invoke the ADC startup timer for a countdown of 256 digital master clock periods to allow the device time to adjust to the new program settings and settle into its operating point before resuming conversions. The ADC standby mode fast command is a useful fast command for immediately halting conversions when in continuous conversion mode. In ADC standby mode, all ADC circuitry is powered and settled into their required operating points so conversions can resume immediately on the next conversion start restart fast command as required by the application. The ADC shutdown mode fast command will place the delta sigma converter in a shutdown state so it does not consume any current. As previously mentioned, once in this state, the ADC must transition to standby mode after 256 digital master clock periods have expired before it can resume converting. The full shutdown mode fast command will place the entire ADC device in a shutdown state, with the exception of the SPI interface, and consume less than 5 microamps of current. The SPI interface must remain active even during full shutdown mode to ensure the device has a means to resume normal operation at any time. When in full shutdown mode, even the POR circuits for the AVDD and DVDD power supplies will be placed in shutdown. Therefore, in the event of a power loss when in full shutdown mode, the AVDD and DVDD power supplies must fall below 100 millivolts before power can be reapplied to guarantee proper POR. If this power down condition cannot be guaranteed by the application, partial shutdown mode is recommended in lieu of full shutdown mode where the POR monitoring circuits remain active. And finally, the device full reset fast command will reset the entire register map of the ADC to its default POR state, including non-writable registers such as the ADC data register. Therefore, if at any time the application requires the ADC data register to be cleared, a device full reset fast command is the only means to achieve this register reset during normal operation. It should be noted the only difference between a POR event and a device full reset fast command 
is the POR status bit in the IRQ register is set to a 1 after a full reset and is reset to 0 after a POR event. This small distinction allows the application the ability to determine the occurrence of a POR event versus the execution of a user invoked fast command. The next topic of discussion is the read command 16-bit SPI communication CRC. The 16-bit communication CRC is appended to the end of each static or incremental read command when the CRC COM enable bit of the config3 configuration register is set. In case of a static read command, the CRC value will be appended after each single register read has completed. The first CRC value generated following a chip select falling edge for a static read command will include the current contents of the status byte in the CRC value. However, if data streaming is performed, for instance when continuously reading the ADC data register, the CRC value calculated for each subsequent read will include the current value of the ADC data register only. That is, no other data will be included in the calculated CRC value in this case. In case of an incremental read command, the CRC value will be appended to the last register of the register map. Similar to the static read command, the first CRC value generated following a chip select falling edge will include the current contents of the status byte. However, rather than transmitting the CRC value after every register read, as is done with the static read command, the CRC value for an incremental read command is not transmitted until the last register of the register map is read. In this case, the CRC config register located at address F. Once the CRC value has been transmitted, if the incremental read command continues past the CRC config register at address F, rolling over to the ADC data register at address 0, the CRC value will not be calculated and transmitted again until the full register map is read, ending once again after the CRC config register, as shown here. In this particular case, however, the CRC value will not include a status byte value, as a chip select falling edge has not occurred since the last CRC value was transmitted. The 16-bit CRC checksum value generated uses the CRC16 ANSI polynomial as defined in the IEEE 802.3 standard, which is defined as x to the 16th plus x to the 15th plus x squared plus 1. This is also referred to as an 8005 hex polynomial. The CRC16 engine offers detection for all single-bit and double-bit errors, all errors with an odd number of bits, and all burst errors of length 16 or less. A couple methods can be used to verify the CRC value and ensure the data has been received without corruption. The first method we'll discuss is the zero result method. As its name implies, with the zero result method, the final value calculated should be all zeros. The following calculations can then be performed to verify the integrity of the data value received. First, append the received CRC value to the end of the preceding data value. The 8005 hex polynomial is then left aligned with the first non-zero bit in the data value with appended CRC. The polynomial is then XORed with the data value and appended CRC. The polynomial is then right shifted to left align with the next non-zero bit in the XOR result of the previous step. Steps 2 to 4 are then repeated until the final XOR result is the same length as the polynomial. When this occurs, the resultant XOR value should be all zeros, as demonstrated here. Another method of CRC verification is the appended zeros method. With the appended zeros method, the final value calculated should be equal to the CRC value received. A similar process to the zero result method can again be performed to verify the integrity of the data value received. First, append zeros to the end of the preceding data value. The 8005 hex polynomial is again left aligned with the first non-zero bit in the data value with appended zeros. The polynomial is then XORed with the data value and appended zeros. The polynomial is then right shifted to left align with the next non-zero bit in the XOR result of the previous step. Steps 2 to 4 are again repeated until the final XOR result is again the same length as the polynomial. When this occurs, the resultant XOR value should be equal to the CRC value received, as demonstrated here. 
By utilizing the read command 16-bit SPI communication CRC, communication sequences can be secured and protected from events such as EMI interference and large transient spikes and maintain data integrity during the application's lifetime. Now, let's talk about some of the error correction features available on the MCP3X6X family of devices. The first error source we'll discuss is the offset error, which can be best described as a shift of the ideal transfer function such that a zero volt input voltage creates a non-zero output code. As we illustrate here, offset error can occur as positive offset, which results in a shift of the ideal transfer function to the left, or negative offset, which results in a shift of the ideal transfer function to the right. It should be understood that while the available codes of a unipolar ADC with differential inputs are not affected by offset error, the input range of the ADC does become limited even once the offset error has been corrected, as we show here. Error compensation is simply the process of making the actual transfer function resemble the ideal transfer function as much as possible. Offset error compensation, in particular, is accomplished via the offset cal register, which utilizes a 24-bit two's complement value for the error correction. Since the MCP3X6X family of devices are unipolar ADCs with differential inputs, the offset can be effectively calibrated using a single point zero volt input where the VN plus and VN minus inputs are shorted together and grounded. An ADC conversion is then executed with the result indicating the nature of the offset, whether positive or negative. Once the offset value has been determined, it can be negated using two's complement format and loaded into the offset cal register. Once the EN off-cal bit of the config3 register is set, each subsequent conversion will automatically be added to the offset cal value with the result loaded into the ADC data register, completing the offset error correction. It should be noted that while this technique is effective for unipolar ADCs with differential inputs, it may not necessarily work for unipolar ADCs with single-ended inputs, as these ADCs could potentially have a negative offset with no means of error correction. Therefore, to calibrate single-ended ADCs, the input voltage should be increased slowly until the first output code is detected. Then, simply solve the equation shown here for offset cal using the applied input voltage which generated the 1LSB output code. And finally, once again, since the offset cal register utilizes the 2's complement format, the calculated value for offset cal must be negated before being loaded into the register. Once the offset error has been corrected, the next step in the calibration process is to adjust the output for gain error. Gain error can be best described as the full scale error of the device, less any offset error, where full scale error is defined as the deviation of the last output code transition voltage of the actual transfer function from the last output code transition voltage of the ideal transfer function. Similar to offset error, gain error can occur as positive gain, in which the slope of the actual transfer function is greater than that of the ideal transfer function, or negative gain error, in which the slope of the transfer function is less than that of the ideal transfer function. It should be noted that as a result of gain error, the ADC input range becomes limited where gain error is positive, and the output codes become limited where gain error is negative. Once again, the objective of error compensation is to make sure that the actual transfer function resembles the ideal transfer function as much as possible. Once the offset error has been corrected, the gain error can be determined by calculating the slope between two points along the actual transfer function using the simple first order linear equation y equals mx plus b, as we show here for positive gain error. Once the slope values have been determined, the gain cal register 24-bit fractional multiplier can be calculated from the ratio of the ideal transfer function slope, m ideal, and the actual transfer function slope, m actual. The resulting multiplier can then be loaded into the gain cal register, which offers a multiplier correction range of 2 to the negative power of 23 up to 2 minus 2 to the negative power of 23. Once the EN gain cal bit of the config3 register is set, each subsequent conversion will automatically multiply the ADC data register value by the value in the gain cal register with the final calibrated output code result loaded into the ADC data register. Lastly, it should be noted that if EN off cal and EN gain cal are both enabled, the automatic sequence of events for the MCP3X6X family of devices 
is for the offset error correction to be executed first, followed by the gain error correction. The final topic of discussion is in regards to the two multiplexed functions available on the IRQ MDAT digital output pin. The first and most likely use of the digital output pin is as an open drain interrupt alert, configured via the IRQ mode 1 bit and can be easily interfaced to an MCU by way of a pull-up resistor and used to alert the host controller of interrupt events such as a power on reset, a register configuration CRC error, which indicates an unexpected change in the configuration register settings, as well as when a conversion has started and when new data is available to be read. The second function of the IRQ MDAT output pin is as the 4-bit raw data output of the Delta Sigma modulator. The output of the Delta Sigma modulator utilizes four comparators to provide a 4-bit output code with each bit representing the state of the corresponding comparator output with a single comparator output calculated every analog master clock period, as shown here. A 4-bit output code is then provided on the IRQM DAT pin every digital master clock period and is representative of the device sampling rate. Since the modulator utilizes a thermometer output coding scheme, there are five 4-bit output codes which are possible with each sample taken. Plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, and minus 2. Once the desired number of samples have been collected, the next step is to calculate a digital output code. There are two methods we'll discuss for computing the digital output code. The first method is the ones and zeros density method, which essentially counts the number of ones versus the number of zeros in the output bitstream and calculates their respective ratio relative to each other. Taking the difference of these two ratios and then multiplying by V ref will yield the voltage seen at the input of the ADC, i.e. the conversion result. To illustrate this concept qualitatively, we can place the total number of bits, as determined by the OSR, on a scale spanning minus VREF to plus VREF. If the bitstream consisted of all 1s, it would indicate a full-scale output of plus VREF, whereas a bitstream of all zeros would indicate a full-scale output of minus VREF. Therefore, by treating the density of 1s as the total positive displacement relative to the zero reference, and the density of zeros as the total negative displacement, their difference would be a net displacement in the positive or negative direction, indicative of the conversion result. To illustrate this by example, let's assume a use case where the OSR equal 4, for simplicity, and VREF equals 3 volts, with the resulting output bitstream as shown here. Since there are 10 ones and 6 zeros, the total net displacement would be a plus 4 in the positive direction, or plus 4 over 16. Similarly, if we had 11 zeros and 5 ones, the total net displacement would be minus 6 in the negative direction, or minus 6 over 16. If we were then to simply multiply these ratios with sine by the absolute value of V ref, the result would be the fraction of V ref seen at the input of the ADC, i.e. the conversion result. The other calculation method is the simple averaging method, which takes the decimal value encoded by the 4-bit modulator output stream, adds them up, and divides the sum by the OSR. Since the codes span minus VREF to plus VREF on a scale of minus 2 to plus 2, the result of the averaging can be considered the total displacement from the zero reference point and indicative of the conversion result of the ADC. While this example is only a first order approximation of how to calculate a conversion result based on raw modulator data, it can be understood that higher resolution can be achieved by simply averaging a larger number of 4-bit samples. For example, by performing a moving average over blocks of OSR samples rather than just over one OSR period. Now, let's take a moment to recap what we've covered thus far. First, we discussed the SPI interface and the different commands available to perform read and write operations, as well as single byte fast commands, which can be used to initiate conversions, reset the device, or place the device into a particular power saving mode. We also discussed the SPI communication CRC how the CRC is calculated, and how it can be verified for each SPI communication sequence. Then, we discuss the offset and gain error of the device, what they are, and how they can be calibrated using the offset and gain cal registers. And finally, we discuss the IRQ MDAT digital output pin, which can serve one of two purposes, as an open drain interrupt alert, which can be easily interfaced to an MCU by way of a pull-up resistor, 
as well as a means of performing off-chip filtering and decimation of the raw data output of the Delta Sigma modulator for the purpose of producing an output code of a desired resolution. With that, this will conclude our presentation on the SPI interface, offset and gain error calibration, and digital output functions available on the MCP3X6X family of Delta Sigma ADD converters. For more information regarding the MCP3X6X family of devices, please go to www.microchip.com, click on the search glass on the top right corner of the home page, enter the part number of the device you wish to search for, and select the product page where all information, including the device data sheet and any demo and evaluation boards available for the device, will be provided. In closing, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to view this third and final video regarding the key feature set of Microchip's new MCP3X6X family of Delta Sigma 80D converters. Please be sure to check out our other technical videos and courses on our Microchip University page located at www.microchip.com. Thank you and have a nice day.